Okay, so 80% of what we experience as taste is actually smell. That's our olfactory re receptors, um, which you can see here. The um, olfactory receptor neurons are in the nasal cavity and the hairs, um, which we call cilia, um, project out. And the cilia have the receptors on them that the odor molecules actually bind to and that's how we smell. So each bipolar, these olfactory neurons are bipolar, each bipolar sensory neuron has one dendrite that projects into the nasal cavity so we can follow that, right? Projects into the nasal cavity where it terminates in a knob um, containing cilia, right? So we have our cilia, we have our bipolar sensory cell, it goes um, up to the olfactory bulb. Uh, it, there will be interneurons. You don't need to memorize mitral and tuft secondary neurons, but just the fact that uh, you have your cilia in the nasal cavity that are attached or part of the olfactory receptor. The olfactory receptors are bipolar and they will meet up or they will synapse um, in these compartments um, called glom glomeruli, right? And you've seen um, the same word in the um, kidney, right? So it's just a little, little compartment, right? Um, so the cilia detect odors in the nasal cavities. The cilia plasma membrane has the receptor proteins for the specific odorant molecules, and then they synapse with inner neurons in the olfactory bulb. Okay. Each receptor makes a specific protein receptor for specific odorant molecules. Okay. So we have approximately 380 different receptors, but some receptors will be stimulated um, lightly, others will be stimulated heavily, and others won't be stimulated at all. And so each uh, thing that you smell is actually com composed of lots of different odor uh, molecules and our brain recognizes the specific pattern. So even though we only have 380 receptors, we are able to make over 10,000 different patterns and detect, um, you know, 10,000 10, different types of odors. We also have a very strong memory response uh, with this as well. Um, so the axon of each olfactory neuron only conveys information relating to the specific odorant molecule that stimulated it. Not all order odors can bind to all receptors, right? So we have specific receptors for specific odorant molecules. Okay, now um, binding of the molecule causes a second messenger reaction with the G protein. And you, we've already gone over those steps. Um, if you don't remember them, review them, okay? Uh, once this uh, binding occurs, the cell will be depolarized and fire an action potential. The, then a synapse with the second order neuron in the olfactory bulb and then to the brain, right? So again, you need to remember um, that there is a second order neuron in the olfactory bulb. I'm not going to ask you the name of those two types of second order neurons, okay? Just second order neurons in the olfactory bulb. Okay, memory and smells. There's a direct connection from the olfactory bulb to the cerebral cortex, which makes the connections with memory regions such as am um, amygdala and hippocampus. So we, uh, we tend to have very strong memory and emotional responses to smells. Other senses, I like taste, have to first pass through the thalamus before going to the cortex. And like I mentioned, certain orders 
odors can evoke emotionally charged memories. So you might ask a question like, can different odors promote particular moods or help boost memory? If you, what if you studied, um, every time you studied Physio, you used a particular scent. This has been done. Um, people claim that it is very effective. I'm not sure if how much research has been done on this, so I can't tell you scientifically, but it makes sense knowing this pathway. And, um, you know, uh, personally, there are fragrances like oranges that I feel like do. Um, boost the mood. So you might want to try try that. Study to some type of aromatherapy that you prefer. Um, see if it helps and let me know. <laughs> okay, so a uh, little activity that we were, we were going to do in class is looking at how the um, hotness of peppers are measured. And so I'm just going to tell you <laughs> that um, that capsation molecule that I told you about that triggers both heat and pain receptors that is found in all of our spicy um, peppers and we measure the concentration of that to know how hot the pepper is in the scale and so I have off to the side pure capsation 16 million units um, and the habanero is somewhere around 100,000 to 350,000 units of capsation, okay? And so on and so forth until you get to the bell pepper, which doesn't have any, it's not spicy. Um, so what is the hottest chili pepper of all, all the chili peppers? Some of you are fans of, of heat, you might already know this. Uh, does drinking milk actually help to calm heat or help to um, soothe the pain? <laughs> from spicy foods? If so, why? If not, why? And what would what do you do instead? So I was, I was going to have you research these answers online. Um, I went ahead and um, did it for you. Um, and so what I found is the Carolina Reaper is at 2 million point two units. And it is the um, all time record for hottest pepper. However, I found something called Dragon's Breath. It's even hotter, um, and it's so hot that it said that it can cause very severe medical issues and even, in some cases, lead to death. It was never intended to be eaten. Uh, it's actually medicinal for um, a topical application. So um, people who use things like Icy Hot, and other topical um, analgesics. They help uh, reduce pain um, and they usually contain capsation and um, that's how it works. So the dragon's breath pepper was actually, they made it to produce so much capsation that we could extract it easier and make these medicines easier, um, not so it could be eaten. So I would say the Carolina Reaper is the hottest edible pepper, <laughs> if you consider that edible. Um, ghost peppers, a lot of people have heard of, those are only about half as hot as the Carolina Reaper. So that's interesting. Um, what else? Oh, plants make this molecule capsation to repel bugs and other pests from eating them. Um, so we're not really supposed to eat these um, from an evolutionary standpoint, right? Um, but, you know, it's all up to you. Now, yeah, milk does help. It, um, it's able to interact with the hydrocarbon tail on capsation and help wash it away. So any, uh, by this logic, any like oil, fat, um, substance would be able to do this as well. Um, so that's why water doesn't help, but milk does. Okay, so now we're going to talk about hearing and um, balance. And then um, lastly, vision. Okay, so recall from anatomy that the outside of the ear is like a funnel and it's the oracle and that helps deliver sound 
um, to and through the auditory meatus, and then that's where you reach um, the middle ear, where your eardrum is, so the tympanic membrane, aka eardrum, and then that vibrates and will stimulate your middle ear ossicles, right? You remember you have your um, staple and um, your three ossicles here in the middle ear that will, um, in turn, they will um, hit your um, round window and cause vibrations now You've taken sound waves in the air and you're turning these into waves in a fluid. The fluid is contained within uh, the labyrinth. So the labyrinth sounds really intense. <laughs> the labyrinth is made up of these semicircular canals um, and the cochlea. And the cochlea is used for hearing. The canals are used for balance location information. Okay, so we're going to talk more about this in just a moment. Okay, and so that's the, the middle ear, and then the inner ear um, is where the, the hearing actually happens, right? So you have your um, cochlea, you have your vestibular nerve, um, right? And then you also have your auditory tube. This is where your ear drains into the back of your throat when you get an ear infection. Um, or inflammation, otitis, um, this, it's this tube, right? Um, what else did I want to tell you? One, okay, so here we go. Let's talk about our vestibular apparatus, a little bit about the cochlea, talk more about that even more um, later. Okay, so the vestibular apparatus is, um, composed of two main parts. We have the otolith organs here in the very center. So the otolith is made up of the uterocele and the saccule, and these are to detect acceleration, linear acceleration, like in a car, driving fast or slowing down, okay? Or walking, running, okay? Um, the semicircular canals you have three of them. The lateral canal is, um, this is what will be used or activated when you spin in a chair, for instance, or you spin around in circles, okay? Um, the posterior canal here, this canal, uh, if you move your head to towards your shoulder, so you tilt, tilt your head towards your shoulder, you have activated the posterior canal. If you want to do a cartwheel, you would activate your posterior canal. And then lastly, you have your anterior canal. And the anterior canal is going to sense, um, like if you bend forward, right? You bend forward at the hips, right? You bend your head down towards the ground, um, right? All right. Now the, um, Sensory structures of the vestibular apparatus and also the cochlea, but remember the cochlea is for hearing, okay? Um, all of the, all of this is uh, filled with fluid called endolymph, okay? And it's also lined uh, with hairs, sensory hairs. And depending on where the sensory hairs are located, um, it, that will determine its function. So the sensory hairs in the uterocilum saccule will tell you about linear acceleration when those are bent, right? Um, we're going to talk more about this in more detail in just a moment. Okay, so the tubular structures are filled with endolymph, and when the endolymph moves, it will bend the sensory hairs, and those sensory hairs are activated when they're bent and so that means that they'll send action potentials, okay? So let's look a little more detail. So sensory hairs t are um, organized into bundles by height, and when you get to the tallest one, it's actually called kinocilium. The, all the other ones are called stereocilia. Of course, those are 
uh, extensions from a membrane, right? Hair-like extensions from the membrane. Um, when the stereocilia are bent towards the kinocilium, that will stimulate action potentials happen. When it bends away from the kinocilium, you will have inhibition, so you'll have much fewer action potentials. And this is how your body knows which direction you're going. More action potentials will indicate one direction, less will indicate the other direction. Okay, so if you, um, if you increase the frequency of action potentials, um, that's due to the influx of potassium. And this is unique and different than everything we've been talking about up to this point, um, right? When we were talking about neurons, it was always sodium would come in and depolarize the cell and trigger an action potential. Now we're talking about potassium. So that's important to note. That's on the next slide for you. Um, okay. Um, all right. So semicircular canals. Um, as I mentioned, the semicircular canals and the otolith and the cochlea are filled with endolymph. In the semicircular canals, the endolymph has a high concentration of potassium. This is very different than all the other extracellular fluids that we've been talking about, right? Um, and again, the moving of the fluid um, will bend the hairs and tell uh, our brain which direction the body is moving. Um, and again, if the stereocilia bend toward the largest hair, the kinocilium, you'll get an influx of potassium and that'll depolarize it, trigger an action potential. If it's bent away from the kinocilium, you'll hyperpolarize, inhibit action potentials. You'll have fewer action potentials. Um, hair cells are therefore acting as mechanoreceptors. Signal will then travel through the uh, cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear nerve. We'll talk about vertigo and uh, nystagmus in lab, but vertigo is that being dizzy, right? And nystagmus is uh, eye movement that happens after you spin around in circles. So we'll talk about that in lab. You'll, you'll get to actually spin in a chair if you volunteer. It's quite fun. Okay, so next we have the cupula and this now, again, we're in the semicircular canal and we're talking about bending the sensory hairs in the semicircular canals. Those sensory hairs project into a gelatinous membrane called the cup cupula. The cupula is more dense than the endolymph surrounding it, um, but, and so this, you get this lag. So as the endolymph um, moves, right? So the, the cupula bend in the opposite direction of the movement of your hair and they lag behind. So the hairs in the cupula will lag behind in the endolymph, right? Um, and again, it's this um, movement, bending the hairs, sending a signal of the direction of the movement. This, um, I know, is a, a difficult slide to understand. We will evaluate this and test this in the lab, and it will make more sense when you get to, to work with it hands-on. Okay, otolinth Odo, organs. These are the, the uterocell and saccule we looked at. Um, and they have hair cells that bend in response to movement of fluid, right? Just like everything else in the, in this um, vestibular apparatus that we've been looking at. Okay, otoliths are these little stones or rocks. You can think of them. They're calcium carbonate crystals that are suspended in the endolymph, and they help to increase the pushing against the hair. Um, the uterocell is sensitive to horizontal acceleration, where the saccule is sensitive to vertical. Um, so 
future selves, primarily what you're using day to day when you're driving, when you're walking, right? Um, and the vertical acceleration would be like going in an elevator, okay? Um, sound, hearing. So now we're looking at um, the cochlea. So here in this image, the spiral part of the um, cochlea has been unraveled to show the arrangement of the hairs, okay? And also what's being shown are the different sound waves. So if you have a high frequency wave, right, you have a, very, a smaller wave length, so that's shown here in red, and that's going to stimulate hairs close to the entry, right? Um, medium tones, which is probably close to my normal talking voice, would be around the screen, right? And then really low voices would be like this blue um, wavelength, very long wavelength. And so it's going to trigger hairs farther down. Okay, sensory hair is located along this membrane called the basilar membrane. Hairs project into the endolymph in the cochlear duct, okay? Hairs are called stereocilia. Um, however, there are no kinocilia in this part of the ear. Um, otherwise, it's exactly like what we've been talking about. The stereocilia are just large, specialized microvilli arranged in those bundles, okay? Um, they transform sound waves that have been, that are in the fluid, and it um, turns it into nerve impulses, right? Sound moves through the endolymph fluid, bends the hairs, and then the hairs will trigger, the bending of the hair will trigger action potentials. Um, so a loud noise is going to make a, a lot more action potentials more quickly, right? So a loud noise would be a stronger stimulus, okay? Low pitch sounds stimulate hairs at the far distal end. See this far distal end, okay? And high pitch sounds stimulate at the proximal beginning, okay? So in the cochlea, it's full of endolymph fluid and the hairs are called stereocilia. When sound moves the fluid, the fluid will bend the hairs, okay? Action potential is then created. If it's loud, it's going to make more action potentials. Low pitch stimulates distal end, high pitch stimulates prox proximal end. And we will talk about conduction deafness and sensory deafness in lab, but just give you an introduction. Conduction deafness is looking at the transmission of sound waves through the outer middle ear, and there's an impairment, okay? Um, so sound waves traveling through the outer and middle ear to the oval window, something's impaired, and this is going to affect all sound frequencies, high, middle, and low pitch all of them will be impaired. Um, people with conduction deafness can be helped by hearing aids. Sensory deafness, or also called perceptive deafness, um, this is further into the ear. Um, so transmission of nerve impulses from the cochlea to the auditory cortex is impaired. This is usually particular pitches. Um, so some people, especially as you age, lose the ability to hear high-pitched sounds. It's so really high-pitched sounds. Um, and then other people might have severe damage and um, lose even more right, ability. Um, some people will get um, cochlear implants, but it's not as common as hearing aids, right? It's much, much more invasive process, and it's not going to restore normal hearing it will help you to know that there is sound happening, um, localize where the sound is coming from, but it's not going to be the same as normal hearing. Okay, and then you'll investigate that further in lab. All right, eyeball, remember all the parts of the eye. Okay, so we have light comes in 
through the cornea, travel through the anterior chamber, then goes through the pupil, okay, and then into the lens, okay, and then the vitreous chamber until it reaches the retina, okay, and we're going to talk a bit more about this. Now, something I want to point out, there's a muscle group here and here, right, so at the top and at the bottom, that control the suspensory ligaments. The suspensory ligaments control how convex or how plump the lens is, okay? And so to, to point this out, I've placed this half green circle here so you can make sure to label that. Is the ciliary body, okay? The ciliary body. I don't know why it's not labeled on this picture, okay? It's very important for changing focus from near objects to far objects. Again, it controls the tension of the suspensory ligaments. So how much does this ligaments pull on the lens will change the shape of the lens from being more or less convex. We're going to talk about that more in a few slides. Uh, the process is called accommodation. Okay. Um, so again, light passes through the cornea, through the anterior chamber, through the pupil, through the lens, into the vitreous chamber. The vitreous chamber is a thick, viscous substance. Finally, you get to the neural layer. The neural layer has all the neurons, including your photoreceptors, um, and so we refer to that as the retina. Okay. We're also going to talk more about this particular region of the retina called the fovea centralis. We're also going to talk about this optic nerve. Um, so here um, we have this image. If you were looking into somebody's eye, okay, with the tool, the ophthalmoscope, never say that very well, um, this is what you see in the um, upper left corner. This is an actual image of looking into somebody's eye. And you see this bright yellow spot? And that's the macula lutea. Lutea means yellow, so it's the yellow spot. <laughs> and within the yellow spot, in the center of it, is an area where all the extra, all the, you know, the neurons have bent away. And so you have um, just the cones just the cones. And so we can receive light basically directly as it passes through that vitreous humor directly onto the fovea. You're going to um, have your most, um, your visual acuit acuity is highest, right? So you're going to see best um, when images are focused on the fovea centralis. And this is only going to work when there's enough light. So during the daytime, um, because these only have cones, cones require more light. Okay, so light passes through the retina and is absorbed in the dark pigment chorid layer underneath. While passing through the retina, some of the light will stimulate photoreceptors, which in turn activate other neurons. Neurons in the retina contribute fibers that are gathered together at a region called the optic disc. So all, everything from all the retina will gather together in this optic nerve here, okay? And this opening here is called the optic disc. And there are no photoreceptors in this area. So this is the blind spot of the eye because there are no photoreceptors, okay? So we talked about the fovea, fovea centralis being the best place for an image, right? And then we talked about the optic disc being the blind spot, so the exact opposite. Okay, now I told you the fovea centralis is only cones, which is how you see color, right? And it requires more light. So all the rest of your retina, besides the blind spot, are going to have both rods and cones, okay? 
um, rods will um, converge. We're going to see that in a few slides. Um, they converge onto, um, so several rods will converge onto uh, a neuron, and so they're more sensitive to light. So that's what you use um, for your night vision. We'll discuss that more in a moment. Okay, but in the fovea, each cone is paired with just one ganglion cell. So fovea centralis has only cones, which you use during the day. Your eyes orient themselves so that the image falls on the fovea centralis, whereas most of the peripheral regions of the retina have both rods and cones, and you're not going to have as much visual acuity in the peripheral. The fovea, each cone is paired with one ganglion cell, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Rods, on the other hand, converge, so several rods onto one ganglion cell. Okay. Um, also important to notice that, you know, we said, talked about how the light travels through and hits the retina, but the image will be flipped, okay? Um, if you were to take any lens and focus light or an image through the lens and through a liquid, you would get the same effect. Um, you've done this in the lab every time you've used a microscope. Okay, so same concept. Um, I was talking to you about accommodation. How does the shape of the lens change so that you can see objects that are far or objects that are close? Okay. So again, you have your ciliary muscles, and this tends to be um, a difficult concept for a lot of people because it's counterintuitive. So please listen up. When the ciliary muscle is relaxed, okay, so in this top image, when the ciliary muscle is relaxed, this is going to help you see distant, far away objects. And furthermore, it's this ciliary muscle is relaxed and that places more tension on the suspensory ligament. This higher tension is going to pull the lens more tight so it will be less convex. And then the image will be um, seen for distant objects, okay? Here, when the ciliary muscle is contracted, think about flexing your bicep and getting that bulging bicep, okay? So when you get the bulging ciliary muscle, it's taking up space now. And that space um, allows for less tension on the suspensory ligament, right? It's taking up space. And so now the suspensory ligament is more relaxed and does not pull as hard on your lens. So your lens is now able to be more uh, plump, more convex, okay? And this helps us to see objects that are close. So that process is called accommodation and this is just repeating what I just said, okay? So in order to see objects that are distant, you need the ciliary muscle to relax. The relaxed ciliary muscle is going to pull tighter on the ligament, suspensory ligaments, which pulls tighter on the lens, makes it less convex, okay? To see objects that are close, ciliary muscle contracts. The ligaments then are not pulled as tightly, and the lens is not pulled as tightly, and it'll be more plump or convex, okay? Okay, so different types of vision, um, normal vision, the image is focused on to the retina, okay? So, emetropia, normal vision, the rays are focused on the retina. Myopia, on the other hand, when the eyeball is more elongated than it should be, is going to cause the image to focus in front of the retina. It didn't reach the retina, because now the retina is farther away, because your, your eyeball is longer, okay? Um, and so to correct this problem, you need a concave lens, okay? And concave lens is going to correct nearsightedness. So again, the um, eyeball is um, too long, 
the image falls in front of the retina, this makes you nearsighted. You can only see things that are close, not far away. All right, and you correct it with a concave lens. Next, hyperopia, farsightedness. This tends to be more common as you age, okay? Um, or I'm sorry, the opposite. Hyperopia is more common in children, and as they grow up, the eyeball tends to elongate, hopefully only to the normal shape, but sometimes it continues to elongate and become nearsighted. Anyways, hyperopia, shortened eyeball, now your image is going to focus behind the retina. Okay, so this makes you farsighted. You see things far away better than you do up close. Um, and you would correct this with the opposite, a concave lens. Okay, um, so when people use um, re reading glasses, right? Reading glasses help you to see things that are up close. So that would be this kind of problem here. Um, of course, in adults, you know, when you, in your 50s, when you have reading glasses, it's actually not necessarily the shape of your eyeball that has changed, but the um, flexibility of the lens. So the ability to accommodate is what changes in that in that case. Um, and then astigmatism means that there's some uneven surface, and uh, so there's an uneven surface in your lens. It ends up bending those light rays and um, and then that compromises your image. So you would need an uneven lens to counteract that so that you can get all the light rays focusing at the same point. Okay, so this is repeating exactly what I just said. So read over this. You do need to memorize all of this. Now something that wasn't on that image is um, the what I was talking about, old eyes needing um, reading glasses, uh, presbyopia, uh, again, is not because of the shape of the eyeball, but because of the flexibility of the lens. You, you lose your flexibility in your lens as you age, and so then you need reading glasses. Okay, photoreceptors. Um, light, not only is it traveling through all the parts of the eyeball we already went over, but then once it reaches that neural layer or the retina, it still has to travel through a lot of different cells before it reaches your rods and cones, unless you're in the fovea, right? Okay, so in the rest of the retina, outside of the fovea, you light has to pass through your ganglion cells, your... Um, other cells, bipolar cells, right, before it reaches these photoreceptors all the way at the bottom, okay? Um, rods, again, detect low levels of light, so they're better um, and more often used in the dark. Uh, normal light during the day will bleach out your rods, and you won't be able to use them. Uh, cones, are detected for color. This is why you cannot see what color objects are when you're in the dark. <laughs> um, purple pigment in the photoreceptor is called rhodopsin, and um, this, in response to light, the rhodopsin will uh, dissociate into two parts, retinine and opsin, okay, and that's the bleaching reaction. So, like I said, um, your rods with rhodopsin will be bleached by normal daylight and you'll only be using your cones at, in the daytime, okay? Um, it takes about 20 minutes to transition. So when you go into a dark room, um, you gradually see better and better over a um, 20 minute period. And it's at 20 minutes you have your full night vision. As soon as someone turns on the light, you gotta start all over again, and that light's gonna seem very bright, right? Okay. Next, the uh, three types of cones. We have three types of cones, and notice that we say we have a cone for blue, for green, and for red, but they detect pretty far, right? 
So there is a lot of overlap. So when you see blue, you're not only using this cone um, unless you're in the wavelengths uh, below 400, right? But anything at 400, you will stimulate all of your cones, um, but mostly your blue cone, right? Um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a trichromatic color of vision. S for short wavelength, this detects your blue. M for medium wavelengths, this detects your green. L for long wavelengths, it detects red. But again, there's lots of overlap. So one particular color of light can stimulate more than one cone. During the day, light bleaches out your rods. So only your cones are being used um, probably right now. <laughs> okay, pigmented epithelium. Uh, so this image is basically the reverse of what we were looking at a couple minutes ago, where now we have light coming in from the bottom, passing through your ganglion cells, through your bipolar cells, um, and then onto your rods, right? And, and then your rods are stimulated and they will send the impulse to the bipolar cells. And um, when it's rods, notice you have two, three rods right one two and three rods converging or all touching the same bipolar cell so you have this three to one ratio for rods so low levels of light can be detected because they're all detecting the light and sending it to the same cell okay whereas cones it's one to one so you're not going to get as strong of a stimulus on this bipolar cell because you only have one cell talking to it. But this, this bipolar cell is going to get a much stronger stimulus because it has three rods talking to it. Okay.